Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brandy. We want to welcome you um, into the first of a series of three webinars focused on the exciting and all-important topic around fatherhood engagement. So I want to turn it over to one of my most favorite folks. If you've never had the honor to meet David Jones, you're going to really enjoy your time with him today. And he's going to kick us off uh, this afternoon. Um, and so, David, take it away. Okay, thank you, Brandy. And of course, you know, we feel mutually the same way about each other. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Jones, as Brandy said. I'm the Senior Program Specialist and Co-Lead of the Office of Head Start's Father Engagement Efforts with Kirsten Beigel. On behalf of Ann Linehan, Acting Director of the Office of Head Start, and my colleagues from the National Center on Parent, Family, and Community Engagement, we'd like to welcome you to our first webinar, Welcoming Fathers, Program Environment, and Strong Family Partnerships. This work is so important to the Office of Head Start's mission to engage families with a specific focus on fathers. We are so excited about this three-part webinar series for a number of reasons. We have a solid team of skilled facilitators with a lot of expertise in this area. But what is even more exciting is we are including, for the first time, a number of voices you may not be familiar with, fatherhood champions from across the country. Our champions are advocates, defenders, promoters, and supporters who are fighting for a worthy cause, improving outcomes for children and families, by engaging fathers and supporting staff in their efforts to do so. Many are fathers themselves, and one of our champions is a mother, and yet they are all familiar with the Head Start Birth to Five Father Engagement Guide, and they have great stories to tell that can support your implementation efforts. So thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Brandy? David, thank you so much. Well, we really want you to be able to see and feel connected to the, each of the um, voices that you're going to have, you know, the pleasure to share time with this afternoon. And I have to tell you guys, in all of our um, preparatory conversations, I have learned so much from the men that you see before you on the screen, including David, who you just heard from, from Off the Pit Start. My name is Brandy Blackbacker, and I work for the National Center on Parent Family Community Engagement. I have the true, true pleasure of being the Director of Training Technical Assistance and Collaboration. And as, as David mentioned, we all have a very big heart full of passion for this for this topic in particular, and just can't wait to jump in. But before we do, I, I want to um, connect quickly with both Jermaine and William. You're going to be hearing from them throughout the course of our hour together. And I know, Jermaine and William, we were thinking about um, the question that we just asked of the group, if you had that one hour of time um, to spend doing something in the way of us getting to know each other in this virtual community. But we want to give you guys both two to three minutes to share a little bit about each of yourselves and of course, we'll continue to learn more as we uh, go through the conversation. But um, Jermaine, would it be okay to start with you to say hello? Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jermaine Evans. And first off, I'd like to thank Senior Program Specialist David Jones from the Office of Head Start, Sheila Juma, and Brandy Thacker from the National Center on Parent, Family, and Community Engagement for allowing me to take part in this webinar series on fatherhood engagement. I function in the capacity of a volunteer mentor for over 10 years now in fatherhood programs for at-risk youth and teen fathers. I facilitated some workshops centered on the importance of education, self-empowerment, and life skills. I've also participated in panel discussions and represented the programs I've mentored in to discuss workshop content and practical strategies for engaging fathers. Having been a teen father myself, I have an understanding of what it is to negotiate the varying degrees of joy and confusion, as well as proactively educating oneself, being prepared, and having a willing and capable support system to help create a healthy, loving environment for a child. I gained this knowledge mostly through trial and error, because some of those important key things I just mentioned, I didn't have consistently or in an adequate supply. I also was not aware of the institutional supports that were available to me until my questions were heard by someone who wanted to see me succeed in my role as a father, which actually is the catalyst for me wanting to be involved in this type of work. I am fortunate enough to be the father of two incredible young men, my oldest son, Devon, who's 25, and my youngest son, Raphael, who's 15. Both are naturally intelligent, loving, and caring individuals 
will continue to motivate me to be a better person and a better father. Jermaine, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm so glad you're here, and we're excited to hear more from you throughout our time. And, and certainly, William, how about would you like to take a few minutes to say hello to the group as well? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And hello. I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Jones and uh, Brandy and the uh, National Center for Parent, Family, and Community Engagement. Um, uh, my name is William Scott, and I grew and I'm sorry, <laughs> I was born and raised actually in St. Louis, Missouri, and I was recently engaged, and I moved last year in July to Dallas, Texas, where I'm the uh, Region 6, I'm the Regional Field Specialist for Region 6, uh, so I love that area. Um, I got in the fatherhood, um, uh, well, I was back in St. Louis, and I first I, I joined the uh, began to work for Head Start, and one of the great things about Head Start is they send you off to professional development. And what I've been hearing lately is, remember, everybody, take the information that you get back to when you go to these professional development meetings. Take it back to your colleagues and your peers and your families and your friends. And that's just what I did. Uh, I was a young father in uh, Head Start working, and I went to. Uh, this uh, conference, and there was uh, a man there uh, presenting. His name was Chester Danes, and he's with the St. Louis Father Support Center. And so I took that information back because I'm like, oh, my buddies, you know, we're all fathers. So I took it back to Head Start, but I also took it to my friend. And I said, hey, guys, here's this information. Now, the funny part here is, um, you know, I went on about my daily life, and then one day I see all my friends get into the car, and they get into the rock, and I say, hey, hey, where are you all going? And they said, we're going to the Father Support Center. I said, well, what's that? They said, we're going to the information. So, so it was one of those things where uh, I, there was a resource there, and, and, I, and I got it. And through the years, the St. Louis Father Support Center really helped me to become a man and a father and to grow and to learn as well as his stuff. And then also, uh, through Head Start, the Father Support Center and my Head Start grantee began to work together, and we began to do community events and things like that. So we helped each other. So my path then moved on, and I also did a stint uh, uh, with uh, another agency, uh, Early Childhood Home Visiting Agency, and I began to learn about infant mortality. So I also began to travel around uh, to bring awareness uh, about uh, fathers and uh, how that they can be supportive and in trying to help reduce the rate of infant mortality. Uh, I have five children. Uh, my youngest has graduated from high school, and I'm so proud. Uh, he'll be attending Howard University, and then I will inherit two wonderful uh, daughters July 1st when I get married. Uh, that's a story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> William, I love your enthusiasm. You guys can see how you're in for a treat, right? Uh, I just There's such a passion and a belief in what we do and, and just an, an enthusiasm. And I, I can almost guarantee that it's contagious. So let's see how you feel at the end. We'll check it back in. <laughs> in that vein, let's transition a bit to um, the intentionality of the question that we asked you in the very beginning, which is, if you had that one hour of free time, how would you spend it? And you guys have been so generous to kind of share what you would do with that, that little slice of a moment. And as we were thinking about sort of setting the context and creating the environment together to share ideas about our service beside fathers, we thought, well, I wonder what would happen if we asked that specific question of individual dads, males, and fathers that are important in the lives of our little ones. And there were a few things that came up from that. And certainly, William and, and Jermaine, I want to check back in with you guys about these because you had some specific ideas um, related to some of these follow-up questions. What skills and knowledge do you want to pass on to your child? How do you communicate to your child that you care about them or that you love them? And, and um, I'm remembering in our conversation, William, that you gave me a nudge that said, if we had the chance to create the space to ask questions of fathers how they want to spend time, they may even say that they want to spend it with each other as that in a group of conversation and support. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one of the things that I've heard is that 
and you realize it's men love to talk. Uh, a lot of people don't believe that, but they do. If you give them the space, and, and sometimes you have to stop and take a pause and wait and listen, and once they get started, they roll. And so what I found is that men love to talk, and when they get together, they'll share stories, but the most important thing that they'll do is they'll begin to network, they'll begin to uh, talk to each other about how to resolve conflicts and strategize. And one of the things that is really supportive of men is a strong network. Men need to be around other men to see uh, how to uh, have positive interaction with children. And also, that's another network for employment and some other great things. So uh, it's good for men to have space just for them to be themselves and to relax. Yeah, William, I think that's so important, and I, I love what you said about, um, well, there are a couple things here, and this is, and you guys feel free in general chat to raise sort of your own ideas, your own celebrations, things that you want to sort of lift up for the greater good of the group that you found that really work as you're engaging your fathers. But one of uh, one of the things that we always go back to, uh, William, and that notion of, of bringing that together and creating the space is to, you know, sort of um, lean on their guidance. And, and David taught me something a long time ago about really being able to watch and connect with fathers as individuals. And, and this isn't a, a judgment statement on my part, but not in the way that we might accidentally assume or assign stereotypes to what all dads may enjoy, what all dads may want to be involved or engaged in. So I really like that you took us to the uh, sort of space of, you know, dads actually do really like to talk. <laughs> Let's create some space to make sure they have the opportunity, you know, to do so. And I, I want to add another bullet here as well for you guys to consider as sort of we're thinking through some of these. Um, another one that we sort of offered up together that could really inform us in a deep way is, you know, how do you really want to participate in your child's early education program, in your child's development? We know you're an expert on where your child is and where he or she is going. What kinds of ideas could we learn from you as a dad about what works or where things get hard? Now, um, and and um, Jermaine, I haven't forgot about some of the important conversation that we had. I skipped down to this one on purpose, and I'm going to come back. But and I wanted to kind of offer here too. Some of these ideas certainly, I'm sure, feel foundational because we come to this work with such a heart and a passion for really being beside families in a meaningful way. But when we think about doing that with God, sometimes we have to get specific um, with our strategies and our ideas. And I, I think, you know, Jermaine, you had mentioned when we were thinking through some of these questions together that the importance of communication and dealing with emotion and processing as a father cannot be undersold. Do you want to kind of talk to us a little bit about the third bullet on communication and specifically um, the L word, love? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I think in general um, the lines of communication and the, ability, and the ability to effectively communicate during the interactions with fathers and with the staff in any of these programs is very important. Um, men articulate things in different ways, and one of the things, one of the more stereotypical things that we tend to observe, just like you mentioned a moment ago, is the way that we want to emote our feelings, we want to um, emote. And being in a, an environment with other men that allows us the confidence to be able to use that word love in the nurturing way that it should be used in the way that it's expected um, when, in, when, a, when taking on that fatherhood role is extremely important. And I, I can't speak to how important it is enough. Um, just knowing that you're in the company of other people, that society has given this role and this title of father and there's different levels of expectations and, and, and requirements and, and things that allow them to be able to fulfill that role, there comes a lot of conflicting emotions when you're not able to fulfill that role the way that society wants you to. And that plays a large part in how you interact with your child, with other people, and society in general. And if it's not in a very healthy way, if it's not done in a conducive way and they don't have an outlet 
to be to be able to express those feelings that may normally not be looked at as being manly or masculine or uh, in, indicative of being a man, then it again it tends to cause conflict and to a conflict within the person, the individual themselves, and also it hinders the ability to have progressive relationships with their children and their other family members and you know just people in general. So I think communication is extremely important, and but more so importantly, being able to communicate demonstratively about your feelings for your child and how much you care for them and that they know that they have a support system within you. Mm -hmm. I, Joanne, I really like the, uh, there's so there's so much richness in what you just offered, but even in that the, the support system within you, within each other, and sort of that guiding from the side, you know, in true partnership, and being able to, you know, keep those communication lines open. All these are critical ideas. And, and, and William, I, I think that you want to add here. Is that true? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, I, I want to start with how do you, the same question, how do you communicate to your child that you care about them or that you love them? And I just wanted to piggyback on what Jermaine said and just add a little bit to say um, that men show children how much they love them by how they treat their mothers. And I think that's an important piece there that, you know, we should understand. The second thing I want to talk about really quick was what gifts and knowledge do you pass on to your child? We all want to pass something on to our child, and it's about who we are, our legacy. And, and, and for myself, uh, is we are Scots. That's our last name. That's who we are. We value contributing to our community and education. And those are some things I hope that Millie and we think about to pass along to your children your legacy. That's it. Yeah, I think that's important. And, I, you know, I love what you guys said about your legacy. I mean, that, that question really sort of ground in um, sort of, if I really had to stop and think about it, that second bullet, what skills and knowledge do I want to pass on to my child? What are the characteristics? As you said, William, if, I, if I'm in your family and I'm a Scot, what are the things that I want my child to sort of, you know, exude in the way of our traditions and in the way of our legacy? And how can I go about doing that in partnership um, with the folks that, you know, we really work alongside, you know, in the program? So um, I'm seeing that some of you are saying in chat that, um, you feel like these questions could be useful as sort of guiding or probing questions to ask for dad. I think they could give us a lot of really great information to, to get to know fathers in ways that are specific to how they would want to be engaged. And so we don't have to lean, as a few of you said in chat, on those assumptions because not every dad is a sports fan or a fishing fan or we hear over and over, if you allow me to build it with you, I will be there. And, um, you know, we'll absolutely be committed to, to see it to seeing it through in service of and, in, and to the benefit of my little ones. Um, I see so many of you um, given some insight here of fathers who are active. Um, of, uh, William, I'm looking here in, in the chat. Of, you can remember as a very young child that your father, um, who only had a third grade education that couldn't read or write, but made sure that you ate together as a family and that you would share your day so that you could express yourself and, and be, have that bond over a meal and the, and the power of being together and breaking bread at the same time, those memories, it sounds like, are still very vivid for you in the way that they impacted together, that togetherness. Um, well, I, I, we'll leave these up here, and certainly, you know, you guys can have access to these if you find this will be useful. And we'll continue to check check in on our the, the nuggets and the gifts that you are sharing with us in chat. But we also kind of want to give a little tiny nudge here about what we hope to accomplish in our time together today. The focus specifically for this webinar, you heard David say at the beginning that this is the first of three that will happen over the next few weeks. And um, this one specifically is focused on the program environment and how we make our space more welcoming to fathers without ever having to say in a word to start. How do we make sure that our physical space is welcoming and that our attitudes and our behaviors, our belief in the reverence of the important contributions of our fathers is honored straight away, even visually? Then we want to look at some relationship-based practices that support strong partnerships and relationships with dads and fathers. 
And then we're going to actually hear a little bit about strategies, and um, we call them exemplary practices <laughs> from fatherhood champions, which certainly you've already heard from them um, a couple of times. But we're going to hear a little more as, as we go along. Um, and with that, we, we want to start with you continuing, actually, in chat um, a little bit about how you make sure that in your program, if, if, if I was a father and I was walking into your space, how you've intentionally created an environment that supports and honors fathers as they walk in the door. So let, let's work together here in the chat box, and um, where many of you are visibly typing, I can see, and tell me if I were a father or a male who's important in the life of a child in your program, what would I see that I might resonate with? We're going to take a few comments here in the chat, and then um, we have a couple other follow-up questions here. So I'm going to um, mute just a second to give you a little space to kind of tell us. As a father coming into your front door, what would I see throughout your program and your classrooms and your common areas? What comes up for you? All right. I can, let's see. Let me see if I can scroll down here. Oh, pictures of fathers and sons bonding, pictures of families in the classroom. I'm kind of scrolling up and down here, so I hopefully can catch a bit of all the gifts that you are giving us. Um, pictures of fathers and children. Oh, family trees, um, real pictures of the families, father pictures all over. Uh, a volunteer board that displays pictures of our volunteers and several of our fathers. That could be encouraging to other fathers. Um, family fun night, father-child activities where each child has a picture of themselves with their family all in their cubby. It's a great idea. Sending missions, of course, not only dads but males. Um, love the idea of having center fathers on the wall instead of generic posters. Me too, Scott. I think that's an excellent idea. I just saw an idea scroll by. Uh, anyway, I've asked for room dads to sign up in addition to room moms. Even, you know, it's a great point, on our forms, making sure that we, uh, all of our forms, all of um, the things that are just kind of created in the proper course of the function of the program, <laughs> making sure that they're not mama-centric. Um, I see, J. Michael, you're saying um, dad and kid night, math night, cards and dice, science night. Um, let's see, let me scroll back up a little bit here. Oh, yeah, pictures of the activities Christina offers of fathers and their dads, pictures of the adult, adults interacting with the children. I'm seeing um, happy smiling faces to greet them. There is a caveat here that I want to bring up, and it looks like a couple of you might have mentioned it. We are talking about the positive pieces of what we could do to create this safe, welcoming environment for males, dads, and fathers. I'm sure you all have an example in your mind of a time when you went into a space where you saw an image that may not have been welcoming to you as an individual. I'll give you an example. Um, I, don't, I haven't met everybody on the line, I'm quite sure, but I am six foot two, so I'm a pretty tall lady. So when I walk into a program, I'm pretty much a, like a dad's eye fight line. <laughs> I remember doing work in a program once where I came in, and there was a picture of a dad um, that had a red circle around his head and a slash. And it basically said, does he owe you child support? Go get him. It gives me chills to this day because certainly I know the folks in the program were well intended and in support of um, the mothers who may have been struggling with, you know, some specific issues. But imagine the accidental withdrawal that happened just on site without ever even having the opportunity to speak to uh, fathers. Imagine what happens if we don't intentionally think about how we create a space. And it looks like several of you are bringing that up here in chat with not only these positive ways that we're making those connections and meaningful um, the dialogue with that, but um, specifically uh, how to be aware and make sure with our own confirmation that we have purged our environment of things that might 
feel sensitive or even offensive. Um, it looks like some of you are even kind of thinking about that right now and thinking about what pictures you have available for fathers with their children and really making sure that everybody is, um, is raised up in a meaningful way. Let me see. Let me scroll just a little bit more because I have a second one here um, that we want you guys to think about. Mike's with dad, Danish is with dad, um, family friendly, easy to read, books available, William offers, father game night. We have, oh, Cindy, let me see, I see dude's barbecue, <laughs> donuts with dad. So all kinds of things that they could see. I'm going to pause for a second here and put up a couple more because it looks like you guys are pushing me to go a little deeper here. What do I hear and how would I feel? Let's kind of look at a couple of these as well. I'm going to give you a bit of space to to, um, to type, and certainly um, Michael um, is giving us to um, ask staff sort of reflect a little bit about how how we treat women when they come in, and then give that same reflection to your interactions with fathers. Is it the same? What could you do to really um, make sure that your efforts beside you know both are are equally as connected and comfortable. All right, let's see. You'd hear everyone being included in conversation with the same tone. Kimberly offers you were going to hear. Children sharing their daddy and me. Oh, Lorena, a daddy and me journal with the rest of the class. That's exciting. And I was going to say, um, William and Jermaine, I know that you guys want to also add in here. So how about that? Um, we um, pause for a second. I'm going to check in Jermaine with you first to kind of contribute. There was another little bullet here about um, how could you tell me about the value of engaging with my child. So one of the things here that we're going to teeter with, before, you know, before we move on, we want to collect more of your your thinking in chat. But um, Jermaine, when when you sort of looked at this slide and you were thinking about your journey and your experience as a father and now a mentor. What kind of comes up for you as you think about this sensorial experience of see, hear, and feel? What um what resonated with me, especially with um a, a comment that uh Jean Michael Hall spoke to, is something that I definitely saw as being um an aid to the fathers and being feeling more comfortable within themselves and within the space. When he mentioned about having the pictures of the fathers with their kids and and the exclusion of things like the domestic violence, DV posters, and uh, things of that nature, like you spoke to before with the face, with the uh, the father's face, with the circle and the slash door, talking about um, child support. Um, we want to have, we want to try to create an environment for them where they feel comfortable because it's not easy to be able to speak to things of such high emotional value to us, like our children. And in order to do that, at least in the initial stages, to help create that, we should try to foster an environment physically as well as emotionally and with the physical presence of other people like the, uh, the presenters, mm -hmm. the facilitators, and administrators um, in the program, uh, having the smiles and the, and the, and the, and the kind faces and the, and the good vocal tones like some of the others have mentioned uh, specifically in the comments. But there's certain aspects to uh, a physical environment that could be conducive to that. So in my experience, I find that when an open floor plan for the the space is is a good idea because men, as we said before, in some of the planning meetings, and William can can speak to this as well, uh, if he so chose to, uh, we like to have space. Uh, we 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 need our personal space and maybe a little bit more than that to make sure that we feel comfortable. So having that little bit of space, that space between us, can is a good is a good starting point. So with an open floor plan, if you have uh, furniture that can easily be moved, um, so that you can make adjustments depending on how whatever it is the workshop or the presentation that's being done is being conducted to increase the level of participation. So I found that having conference room style seating where there's elongated tables and the fathers are sitting across from each other uh, and next to each other, being able to look at each other as they're speaking and saying these, these varying thoughts they have about 
how they feel and what they're going through and, and, and about their life situations makes it a lot easier for them to engage not only each other but also the, um, the presenter and the facilitator. Um, if at different times the, the, the tables and the seating were set up in a U shape or maybe uh, um, three sides of a square with the presenter standing towards the front or the middle or even at times sitting with the fathers. And I think that was something that was key because it made everybody feel as if they were equal. Now, obviously, there's an authoritative figure that's inside, that's inside the room that's providing, you know, information that they, that they should be paying attention to and, and allowing each other to actually speak. Um, but when that person assumes the role, assumes a position, rather, as if they're part of the group because the dialogue and the learning is it moves both ways. It's not just one person in that authoritative position um, deciding what you should learn and how you should learn and and and, and potentially uh, presenting an issue where there could be value judgments, like they're being talk, the fathers are being talked down to because they're obviously there because they want to be there and they want to learn. They want to be better people. They want to be better fathers. So having an open floor plan like I said before, where the, um, the seating and the area can be adjusted to suit the, um, the, the topic of discussion and also allow for uh, a better opportunity for interaction between the fathers and the facilitator would be a good idea. Yeah, Jermaine, these are so important, and I see that you're getting a lot of support in chat <laughs> with folks agreeing with even just the intentionality and the thought that it takes to really physically create the space that not only feels welcoming but feels conducive to the dialogue, you know, that that we want to have um, with and beside that. I, I want to do two things here quickly. Um, William, I want to check in with you on this. And then I've seen a couple of questions. I want to create some space for any of our panelists to answer. So we'll, we'll pause here for William, and then, then I'll check back in. Thanks, Brandy. And I'll try to be brief uh, because a lot was covered, which is all good. Um, but I've seen some things in the chat, which was father fam uh, friendly books and family trees. And uh, one of the comments I saw was asked, for room dads, and one of the things is that um, men need to see men at every level uh, working with positive, having positive interaction with children. So uh, I like the idea of having real pictures of real fathers and, and with engaging with their children. The other thing was we talked about the domestic violence poster. I, I, I get that, and one of the things about it is strength, strength based resources. So you can have those financial uh, resources in there, legal resources, GED, education, parenting, relationship strengthening, employment training. These are some things that would probably be good. Um, uh, and uh, as uh, Jermaine says, space is crucial because sometimes you get, and you can get that champion father. Everybody has that one dad. Most of them see dads dropping off and picking up. Uh, so you get that champion. And then you allow him to be your ambassador and give him that space, and the men uh, will come. And if they don't, uh, you just keep checking at it. This is not the easiest population to work with, but we're not going to give up on it. Yeah, well said, William. And I, well, there, there's, <laughs> there's so much to add here with just, you know, with the ideas that, that we're making connections to exactly what you mentioned with the strength-based resources and taking a step back to really assess the program. Have we done that in a minute? Are we really reflecting the current set of families and specifically fathers in this conversation that we are partnering beside today? Because um, we do, we have so many things to juggle, but these are the, the deposits that we get to make in relationships beside our fathers that really make a difference in the long run. There are a couple of questions that have come up in chat, and there's one in particular that we got that we sort of want to go back to. And David, I wonder if you would like to jump in here. There was a great question about um, how do we respond or engage, encourage fathers to participate, specifically when they're the breadwinners? What, what would you say to that? Thanks, Randy. Yeah, that was uh, Lynette Rodriguez, I believe. Um, you know, my gut reaction in response to that is that fathers are so much more 
I think um, when you're doing effective um, professional development with staff and you're getting them to be a little bit more sensitive to the way in which they engage fathers or ways in which they want to improve that engagement, they need to see fathers or they need to create opportunities to help fathers expand their definition of their role. Their educators, their mentors, their protectors, their teachers, their advocates, their spiritual healers. Yes, providers is one of those roles, but it's not the most primary role because that's not, you know, where they spend most of their time. In fact, a lot of times when we're sort of engaging these families, they're on the trajectory of sort of finding careers and completing education and getting to a place where they can be, you know, providers, but they're doing other important things as well. David, it looks like your, your comments and your response relate to several other comments, you know, that we found in the chat here too. Amanda, I'm thinking about yours. And, and we'll try to pull a little bit as, as you continue to give us comments and, and sort of share what you're doing and these great ideas and the website. Uh, and we'll also try to capture some of those questions as we keep going through some of these ideas and the content so that we can lift up um, several of these as we go. So thank you so much for that, David. Um, you're welcome. What I'd like to do is transition a little bit because so much of the dialogue you're offering us now, like uh, questions around, well, how do we really engage um, our fathers sort of in, in their child's development? How might we honor the different ways that men and women come to the dialogue? And sort of, you know, how do we even start to begin the, like, uh, exciting conversation around why it's important to engage fathers in the first place? What we've done here is just put a literal, I mean, we could do a whole day-long session on the research that you could consider about why it's critical to make sure dads are engaged in the life and the development of their child. Um, and I know even if they're not in the home currently, but what we know about the science and the research, you know, very, very uh, reminiscent here to what you see on the screen is that engaged fathers prepare children, you can think, for school stronger cognitive and motor skills for interactions with their peers, that social-emotional and social development piece. For addressing challenges, we have um, improved problem-solving skills. And you can see here, kids with engaged dads enjoy elevated levels of physical and mental health are more, look at this, confident, curious, and empathetic, and show a greater moral sensitivity and self-control. These are just a sliver of the benefits that we could offer in, in this dialogue. And I wonder, um, uh, both William and Jermaine, are there other things that you would add here from your personal journey about uh, what you've discovered in terms of, of the benefit of your own engagement in the life of your little ones, or how as mentors and leaders in the field that you've used what you've learned to really um, convey that to other dads? Absolutely. Jermaine, did you want to go first? or you? Go ahead. Oh, no, you can go right ahead. Okay. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that engage early, as early as possible, prenatally, uh, for a deeper in engagement uh, with your child and to build that bond, uh, and it will serve you uh, through life. The other thing I've learned is that rough and tumble play that uh, – you know, some people don't like, but it's a good uh, social and emotional regulator. It helps the children to understand, hey, we're playing. I don't have to kill you if you step on my, sh uh, on my, on my shoes or, or if you bump into me. So there's some really uh, good uh, things here when dads become involved and engaged early. So William, I yes, hear you uh, saying the earlier the better, and Jermaine is going to add in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I jumped in a little bit. Um, yes, I, I definitely agree with what William was stating. And um, I just, per, again, personally, my experience has, has proven to me that, uh, as William said, the earlier you get involved, um, the better. Because the important thing is, there's another, then I would like to add another piece to that. When it's not only just that you get involved, but also how you get involved. There are, there are a lot of there are a lot of identities and roles that society has placed on people, and the fatherhood role is no different. So, when you are a father and you're taking on that role and you're trying to teach your child something, they're going to another one of the socialization agents is society itself. So, when they start to 
put this add these definitions and these uh, attributes to to the different roles that maybe that could potentially be based on you know your social class, your ethnicity, your culture, your your nationality, and they can some the <clears throat> they can sometimes be hindrances to to your positive to positive development. So when you're in that fatherhood role, it's up to you as being one of the primary teachers to your child to be more informed about the way society works and what it's going to try to teach your child so that you can combat that effectively so that they can grow up with a healthy attitude and, and not have self-esteem issues, um, health issues, you know, cognitive development, as you mentioned before, if stigmatization plays a role because of your background, then those are hard things to overcome without the help of your parents, specifically in the role of a father. Just like uh, David said earlier, you know, um, fathers are so much more than just the breadwinners. They're so much more than, uh, so, than a source of financial support. And it becomes really necessary for fathers to become more worldly in their view and how they want to try to increase the likelihood of their child being um, successful in life by being more aware of what they could potentially be involved in because of their environment, the support systems that are in place, the way that society is actually functioning, and their position in it. And, you know, Jermaine, you're bringing so many things to my mind, but I can and I can see in um, the chat box that you stimulated a little bit of dialogue too around um, almost curricula that are available out there. And I know this is a topic that's really prevalent on the minds of the Head Start community specifically right now because of the performance standards that gives us a nod. Um, toward utilizing a parenting curriculum. So what we've been hearing um, sort of as we've been out on, on the road and interacting with programs is that folks are choosing to um, explore and compare curricula to offer specifically for dads, and but not stop there, you know, making sure that they are able to offer opportunities for all families and all family constellations to take part in a curriculum, but they are choosing like at least one of a couple curricula. There are several programs we've met that are using more than one kind to really honor the constellation and the makeup of the family structures that are within their program. And it just, to me, I'm wondering about um, how and what that looks like and sort of what you guys just guided us through about one of many ways to connect um, and, and honor father's connection to their child's development, but also specifically creating the space for them to teach us about um, their child's development and how they want to be engaged and how they can ask us to build on the great things that they are already doing, you know, with their little ones. Um, so this is great. Thank you guys so much. I, the chat is so rich. I'm just very, very um, grateful for all of the sharing that you guys are doing today. And just a side note, I'm going to check with my team off to the side here. Um, there's such richness happening. We do actually keep track of all of the chat that happens, so if it's helpful to, to kind of keep that for others for you to review later as well as all these great ideas are being shared, I believe that we can certainly do that. So I'll check back in with you at the end for some confirmation and then how you can find it again if this is uh, if that's beneficial for you and you're interested. Um, with that, let's let's look a little bit um, here at, an, at another resource that. We created at the National Center on Parent Family Community Engagement, and some of you may have seen this. We love this resource, and it's helpful in so many ways um, to uh, really support our walk beside all families, but specifically for the topic and focus on program environment today. We thought it would be a great idea to bring up um, our positive, our building partnerships, Guide to Developing Relationships with Families. If you guys know this document, and um, we actually have it, um, let me show you where it is so you don't have to run off to the ECLKC to find it. We do have the link here for you on the slide. But 
On the left-hand side of your screen, in the middle pod, there is a little tiny box that says resource to download. And you have um, two there. So if you click on the phrase that says building partnerships, it's going to open up the button at the bottom that says browse to. And it will take you right away to that link on the ECLKC. So if you don't know this resource or you haven't seen it before and you really want to explore it more deeply or print it for you and your colleagues and your families, it's right up there for you for free. To, to do. Um, there's also the Father Engagement Guide that's there as well. So if you guys want to go to those on the left-hand side, you click them individually and click Browse to. It'll take you to those on our website, and you'll be able to uh, reach them there. Um, but one of the things I want to guide us to, and, and the, the two really big concepts, ideas within this purple book are related to attitudes and practices. What you see on the screen before you hear are the four specific attitudes that we believe must be embedded in your wiring and in your toolbox for engagement beside any family. But for the purpose of this conversation, we've taken out the word family and we've inserted fathers. So we want you to kind of try these on for size because a lot of these are not um, new or different based on how we interact with families. But, but let's take a look. Fathers are the first and most important teachers in the lives of their children. They are partners with a critical role in their family's development. They have expertise about their child and their family. And they're certainly contributors um, to uh, our, our dogs, our child development, and they're important and valuable. So I don't know, um, William and Jermaine, if you guys have specific ones on this slide that reached sort of spoke to you, and if you'd like to address um, anything that you see here about either your journey as a dad or your journey as a leader in the fatherhood uh, field of work. And let me start uh, this time, Jermaine, with you. Yes. The, one of the ones that um, stood out to me about um, on the slide, fathers are partners with a critical role in their family's development. Um, and it for me, it, it goes back to communication. Um, communication is, is so very important in these, in these types of situations, but personalizing, being able to personalize and communicate holistically offers a better opportunity for increasing the level of trust and encouragement during a challenging time as being a father or learning, learning that you, you become a father or realizing that maybe you don't have the skill set you believe that you have, that you need to have in order to assume that role effectively, um, can level the, the highest level of communication is, 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 can definitely help that, help ease the tension during that time. So when program leaders make it a priority to become knowledgeable about a father's life circumstance and potentially what impediments they may have to successfully ful fulfilling that role as a father, it can help improve the interactions and foster a level of trust that's necessary in order to gain that, that uh, progressive interaction. Assuming that fatherhood role, that father role, with a desire to do it well can be a hard enough task, but when other stresses associated with their age group, like maybe attending school, uh, neighborhood and peer influence, uh, employment, or stigmatization, can potentially make them more susceptible to making decisions that could undermine their ability to fulfill that role appropriately. Physical, emotional, like for instance, they, they can become physically and emotionally distant. Um, they, they, they may isolate themselves from, from other people and their or their family members. Uh, they could potentially go to turn to drug or alcohol abuse or even sexual promiscuity as an outlet to release some of the pressure that they're experiencing because they're not fulfilling the role in a way that society is telling them that they should. So even when they have some, some level of success, um, if they're not fulfilling that role in the way that's being projected to them, then they often feel as if they're not doing anything. So when the young fathers start to see that value judgments aren't being made about them, because their because of their lack of confidence or their um, their their lack of knowledge in or their ability to fulfill that role as it's prescribed by society, then when they interact with 
the staff or, or the program directors or other fathers in that setting, again, it just relieves a lot of pressure and it allows them to be able to communicate how they actually feel. And that's the only way that you can actually resolve any of the issues or the problems that they're going to have or that they may be encountering, which, after all, the bottom line is that they're going to be evolving themselves to be better people and better fathers. I mean, I love what you say about the evolution and, you know, really being there to support and, you know, kind of travel that journey together and whatever that looks like. And I think, you know, I, I always think that at the hour together that we have is a little bit of a blessing and curse because it goes so quickly and there are so many points that we want to go much, much deeper on, um, especially as it relates to the real. You mentioned, you know, there sometimes there's conflict resolution, there's fear, there are these big emotions that come with, you know, being a parent specifically and in the dynamic of relationship. If you're in a relationship um, and, and, and that is, a, you know, um, a consideration where we're trying to support um, those ideas. And so there are complications that we really need to be in a real space about to support, you know, each other in service of, you know, and benefit for the child. So um, I love the, the nuggets of wisdom that you offer there. And, I, and, William, I'm thinking a little bit about if it's okay with you, clicking over to the next because I see we're getting really close already uh, on our time. And, and with the attitudes that are sort of like, you know, the how we are in our interactions with families, we have some very specific practices that are sort of like, well, what, what would we do here? Like, how do we really do this in a concrete way? And we offer these six for you. They're all in the purple book that we showed you there before. And, and so you can find these again. And we have specific details about each one. We have ways to ha have reflective practice, um, sort of, for you as an individual in your role. We have some reflective supervision laws in this purple book. So it's really, really a rich uh, opportunity to think specifically, though, with these practice in mi practices in mind as we think about dads and males that are important in the lives of, of their children. But William, I know um, as we've talked about this before, there was one here that you're specifically drawn to. And it's the fifth one down, the value of father's passion. Tell me more about that. Absolutely. Um, as a uh, uh, former history teacher, I was in the classroom, and um, I found that most, uh, all of the children love the dramatic play area, including the boys. And what would happen is the boys would go into the dramatic play area, and they would put on the high heel shoes and the little gowns and, and they grab the babies up and they'd hold them and they walk around, you know. And so what would happen is when men would drop off their kids or if they were coming to pick them up, they would walk in the center and they'd walk straight to me. Hey, what are you doing? What's the kind of thing? What are you running in here? And so you know, we got the men's passion. <laughs> we got the passion up. And uh, you know, aside from explaining to the men that these children are learning to nurture and they're learning, you know, and also they're modeling what they see at home. But the the, the other thing I said, I got an opportunity here because these men are passionate about something. So I said, okay, guys, they are wearing the high heel shoes, but now I need you to bring in your boots, bring in your hats, bring in your jackets, bring in the things that you will work with, and then the boys will have some alternatives. Uh, to work with. Uh, also, really, if, if I could, Brandy, really, I wanted to say one thing um, that, and I'll, it's reflect on your own perspective. One of the things that I don't think we need to talk about was uh, other people in the children's lives. And uh, the paternal side is another side that loves this child. And I will tell you that paternal grandmothers love their children. We've got to get them involved. And, and children uh, can benefit from male, positive male interaction, whether it's the cousin, the brother, the uncle, the boyfriend. So we have to build their abilities and ca uh, capacities as well. And I think about my own children, who my sister who has no children, but let me tell you, she played a major, a major part in helping to grow and raise and develop uh, my own children. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, William, that's well said. And actually, it's such a great segue to sort of reflecting on our own perspective, what you said, with 
and specifically in the context of the program with a supervisor, during reflective practice if you have that model, as um, we very rarely as staff folks take advantage of the opportunity with our mental health consultants. I mean, we certainly offer um, them up to our families, but often we don't take as deep advantage as maybe we could um, as staff folks to kind of think through and reflect on our own perspective and as you said William with each other within the construct of a family so that we are even all of one accord in what we bring to the interaction um, with fathers and, and what that really means in a concrete way as, as we're pulling these pieces apart. I know that I, I can't tell you guys this hour has flown so quickly I don't even um, have the words to describe the excitement of not only um, Jermaine and William what you've offered and certainly David you as always but the chat that's happening with the resources and the ideas and the excitement it just makes my heart very full um, and I just kind of want to talk a, a little bit because a few of you have asked questions about some logistics and next steps so let's start with surveys and certificates um, we will send you right after the webinar um, a little survey and if you fill it out for us it will go right to the email address that you registered with probably today or tomorrow. Um, if you fill it out you will get a certificate. So for your own professional development efforts we know that you keep records of all those things. Um, look out for that to come to your email and then we can um, make sure that that goes out. I'm getting some word over here that it will be today that you'll see that coming. Um, the other thing that we want to remind you is we did not even touch this uh, very deeply, the Father Engagement um, Birth to Five Programming Guide. It is also off to the left-hand side in your resource pod. Um, so we want to make sure that if you haven't had the chance to see it yet, there's some incredible resources. And actually, if you're even more interested in pulling apart more ideas around program environment, this um, uh, guide is actually organized by the um, elements from the PFCE framework. And you guys might know that in the pink column of the framework, we have a specific element around program environment. In this guide, we give you all kinds of ideas, tips, and tricks about, um, you know, expanding and extending a little bit on the dialogue we're having today with that specifically in mind. And then certainly, please don't forget, come back and see us. Um, on June 8th, we'll be back together on leveraging community partnerships to support fathers' well-being, and then we'll close up our three-part webinar series with on June 22nd. So several of you who had those specific questions around fathers' um, engagement in their child learning and development, it's the focus of a whole webinar at the end of June on the 22nd. The survey will come to you guys in your email, and you can respond to that, um, and you'll get your certificate. Uh, Brooks, hi. The webinar is recorded, and yes, we can um, certainly make the PowerPoint available, usually in a PDF version, so there aren't size restrictions. Um, and then, also, we're going to stay on. We're going to um, close out the audio, so you'll hear silence, but don't be dismayed by that. We're going to stay in the general chat room for a little bit. So if you still have questions and you want to talk a little bit more about um, any ideas, feel free to hang out with us here. We're at least going to leave it open for about 15 minutes. And then don't forget, um, you can also sign up for our resource flash. It's a quarterly newsletter called the Fatherhood Connection. And you can do that through the ECLKC. Um, before my good southern graces get gone at this late hour, right at 4 o'clock, I want to make sure that um, William, Jermaine, from the depth of my heart, thank you guys so much for all the time you dedicated to the prep for this, all the time that you gave us and the gifts that you shared with the country today in our early childhood world. David, as always, and Kirsten, as our leaders at the Office of Head Start, thank you for the opportunity to really resurrect all of the important ideas around these topics. Thank you to our team at PSCE. Um, Nina and Shella and certainly Jackie, Maureen, um, all of our leaders for just working together to pull this off today and most importantly all of you. So um, enjoy your afternoon. We're going to hang out in chat and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>